Good morning. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. You remind me of churches in the U.S. where everyone wants to sit in the back. Well, there are a few in the front. I'll try to be loud. I am remembering this morning uh, when I was a child, I worshiped with International Church in this building. And I remember the choir sat right here. And I was in the choir, and so was my father. And so I'm standing very close to where I used to sing every Sunday morning. And it is good to be here. This building is also God's gift. There are two lessons in the scripture this morning. They are taken from the common lectionary that many churches use. And so these scriptures are actually appointed for this time of year. Um, they're actually appointed for next week, but I chose them for this week. And the first one is found in the first book of Kings, chapter 21. You might recognize this is part of the story of King Ahab and his wife, Queen Jezebel. Beginning with verse 1 in chapter 21 of 1 Kings. Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. And Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard so that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house. I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. Ahab went home resentful and sullen because of what Naboth, Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said to him, for he had said, I will not give you my ancestral inheritance. He lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and would not eat. His wife, Jezebel, came to him and said, why are you so depressed that you will not eat? He said to her, because I spoke with Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. His wife Jezebel said to him, do you not now govern Israel? Get up, eat some food, and be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So, she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. She sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived with Naboth in his city. She wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth at the head of the assembly. Seat two scoundrels opposite him, and have them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out, and stone him to death. The men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, just as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth at the head of the assembly. The two scoundrels came in and sat opposite him, and the scoundrels brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. 
Then they said to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned. He is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Go, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab set out to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will also lick up your blood. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. I will bring disaster upon you. I will consume you and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond, or free in Israel. It's just like an action movie. It's almost like we have to pause for a minute to think about that story. <laughs> but then here's another story, and this one is about Jesus in the home of Simon the Pharisee in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, beginning with verse 36 and going into chapter 8, verse 3. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke to him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owned, owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled their debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. 
you gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa. And Susanna, and many others who provided for them for him out of their resources. We see, looking at today's lessons, that the kind of God you believe in affects the way you behave toward your neighbors. If you believe in a God who makes some people more important than other people, some lives worth more than other lives, then you might behave the way King Ahab and Queen Jezebel behaved. Or you might behave the way the Pharisee, Simon, behaved. Jezebel the queen clearly believed in a god or gods, gods who did what they pleased, and who did make some lives more important than other lives. The belief in the ancient day was that kings stood in a special relationship to the gods and therefore could do whatever they wished to do. King Ahab wasn't completely sure of this. He had been brought up in the faith of the God of Israel. Queen Jezebel had not. Ahab wanted to believe the same way as his wife but he was haunted by the God of Israel, the God he was supposed to uphold. He was haunted by a God who demanded justice and fairness even from those who had power. But Ahab, like so many human beings, was willing to let somebody talk him into promoting his own selfishness. It is as if his wife said to him, aren't you the king? Kings can do anything they please, and kings should do anything they please. How do you expect the people to look up to you if they're not a little bit afraid of you? But don't worry. I know how to get what you want. Now, there are those in this world who do believe in taking what you can get, or what is sometimes called the survival of the fittest, or what I've sometimes seen in ads, advertising in my country, grabbing the gusto is a term that one hears. For those who believe that that is what life is about and it's okay, for those people, Jezebel was very clever, very clever, very able. Maybe she should have been the ruler. And any of us who has lived in this world long enough knows very well that the gods that Jezebel worshipped are still, still have followers.
still have faithful followers, those gods that teach us to use power over other people, to treat other people as things for our convenience. That was her belief, and that belief is still around. What's wrong with taking what you can get? Now Naboth, the farmer who owned the field of grapes, the vineyard, Naboth had a different understanding, a different idea. He believed that the land was sacred. The land was holy. And he believed that he must preserve that land for future generations, for his children and his children's children. Modern people in this world don't always understand that kind of thinking. But this is the law about the land, which is found in the book of Leviticus in the Bible. In the 32nd chapter of Leviticus, the land was holy. The land belonged to God. When people used the land, it was only in trust. And one person or one family was not to get more land than they had been given in the community. Every 50 years in the book of Leviticus, there came the year of Jubilee. This is something that today Christians don't always pay much attention to this story, but it is in our Bible. The year of Jubilee, every 50 years. Any land that had been sold was to go back to the people who had sold it, to the families that had sold it in the beginning. And all debts were supposed to be forgiven, to be erased. In fact, every seven years, the sabbatical year, the Sabbath year, every seven years, debts were to be given, forgiven, not just every 50 years. What a different world from our world. What a different world from our world. Now, historians and those who study the Bible tell us that this may never have been practiced even in Israel. The law was laid down, and that families should be equal to one another in the ancient times. We don't even know if the ancient Israelites did that. But they had a very surprising idea that families should be equal. And Naboth had some idea about this. It was not just the people of, the ancient, of ancient Greece who had an idea about democracy. It was not just the ancient Greeks who had this idea that everybody has rights, even lowly farmers, and that not even kings have the right to take from the lowly farmer without offending God, or as the ancient Greeks believed, gods. It was clear that when Naboth said he would not give away or sell his land, his reasons were not economic. It was not about money for him. The way he answered the king sounds very disrespectful, very insolent, if we were to read this story and not look into the history at all. But the truth is, the words that Naboth the vintner used with the king of Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel, were the words of an ancient promise. And any of the ancient Israelites who heard this story told would have recognized those words that Naboth said. It was an ancient, ancient saying. And he just repeated it. The Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. This was an ancient oath. This land had been passed down to his family as a trust from the God of Israel. It wasn't a thing to be bought and sold. It wasn't even a means to the end. It wasn't like a bag of salt or a measure of rice that you could just sell. And you know, these ideas about land 
are still alive in some cultures in this world. The Indians, the Native Americans in my country have taught this for generations. You can't buy and sell land. It is sacred. You just live on the land. It is for the future. The Native Australians have taught this for centuries. The land is sacred. Not something that is easy for us to understand in this market economy we live in. Something else was clear in the way that Naboth answered his king. Naboth believed, obviously believed, that the king was under obligation to God's laws and that the king should never be more honored than God. And this issue relates to us in every country today. We have our kings and queens. We may not call them that. They may look different today. But there are people who seize power in every land. And many of them have, them have tried to seize absolute power. Many of them have operated only according to what they wanted, according to their own self-interest, according to their own greedy hearts. Think about some recent rulers in today's world, and I'm going to name some names. Mobutu in Zaire, which is now once again called the Congo. It was said that he wanted power, that he did not always think about the people. Suharto in Indonesia, Sani Abacha in Nigeria, and there are those who say that of Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. These are leaders who, it appears to the world, have tried to take as much power and wealth into their own hands as they could possibly take. And they all, they all had one thing in common. They fell. They all fell from power. And the people did not weep. The people did not mourn. Do you remember the name Pol Pot in Khmer? Cambodia. It was his leadership that caused millions of people to be killed. Everyone who had any education, even people who wore glasses, were killed. The whole world knew his name, Pol Pot. And yet when he died, no one shed a tear. I remember reading the newspaper. I was living in the United States, and there was a political cartoon in the newspaper. Someone had drawn a picture, and at the top it said, Pol Pot's mourners. And down below there was nothing, nobody. Maybe his wife. But you know, these are not the only kinds of people who grab power. We also have entertainers, we have movie stars, we have famous sportsmen and sportswomen, we have owners of businesses who are also kings and queens in this world, maybe not with that name, king or queen. I remember when the Beatles, the rock band, was so big, and John Lennon, who was in them, said, we're bigger than Jesus Christ. Does anybody remember that way back when? He was joking, but he made people angry when he said it. And you know, in this world, we are all, we all have the possibility of breaking the first of the Ten Commandments, that commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. We are all in danger of doing this, letting some human beings be more important than God and let's, letting some human beings be more important than others. Naboth, the man who had the farm with the grapevines, was the bravest of men. 
he stood up to the king, and this was a king who was an absolute king. Naboth had no political power. He had no social power. He had no one to stand with him. And he paid for it with his life. Naboth did not believe that some people were worth more than others, especially when it came to what was his sacred duty before God. It was his sacred, holy task to take care of that land. But you may have seen this in this world, that there are those in this world who use religion to get power, to get what they want. In my country, in the United States, it's kind of a joke. Those who preach on the television, oh, they just want money. They just want to build big houses. And some of them, it does seem to be true. But I would argue that even such preachers are not as dangerous as leaders like Queen Jezebel in this story. She used religion to murder and steal. It was the tradition among the Hebrew people that you had to have two witnesses in a court of law. Two witnesses to a crime, and that would convict someone. So she arranged it, that two people said Naboth was guilty. That was enough. That was the end. There didn't need to be a trial. He was killed right away. Stoned to death by the people, she used an ancient religious tradition to get what she wanted. To destroy a man and to take away his children's inheritance. It still happens today that people use religion to take from those who have little and give to those who already have more. And you know, in my own country, there is a campaign for the election of the United States president. And there is a candidate who appears to want nothing but power, who doesn't seem to look to the people or what the people might need. This happens anywhere in the world. It can happen. And so what are human beings worth in God's eyes? And is the person with power really God's private secretary, as one of my seminary professors used to say? Is it okay, if you have power, to bring out God as though God is a thing that you can use? to get what you want, to force a situation? Do we believe in a God who is happy to let us step on other people so that we might be comfortable? Do we follow a God who doesn't mind when we look down on other people as Simon the Pharisee did in Luke's story that we just heard? You know, Simon was not so interested in despising that woman he was interested, he wanted to make a fool out of Jesus. That was what he was doing. You realize what Luke's gospel is saying to us. To despise Jesus, to look down on Jesus, is to insult the God who made this world and all of us. But to despise someone, this woman who washed Jesus' feet, is also to despise God. Simon insulted Jesus from the very beginning. He invited him and he did not wash his feet. In those ancient times, you made sure that you had someone to help your guests wash their feet before they even came into the house. He didn't do that. He didn't greet him in the traditional way. He didn't put oil on his head, which was also the custom. It would be as if we invited someone today and we did not greet them with a Y at the front door or greet them at all. And then when they came in, we said, well, you, you need to sit out behind the house and the family will eat in here. It was obvious that Simon was insulting Jesus from the beginning. And Simon pretended to be scandalized by this woman because he knew her history. And you know, he was glad when he saw that Jesus 
was accepting her. He thought, well, Jesus doesn't know anything. He's obviously not what people say about him. He's no good. He doesn't know about this woman. He can't even tell. This made Simon happy. But what? He was wrong. He was wrong. Jesus knew. He knew about her. He knew about Simon. And he spoke up. In fact, think about it. There are many times in Scripture where people tried to bring someone who had committed a sexual sin to Jesus. Oh, let's punish this person, Jesus. That's what needs to be done here. Do you remember ever that Jesus got angry at someone for that kind of sin? Jesus got angry at people who had power and tried to use other people as things. Jesus got angry at people who used other people as a means to an end. But people who did not have power, people who already had very little hope, Jesus welcomed them. What Ahab did to Naboth in the story in the king's eyes, Naboth was nobody. But in the end, that sin, that crime that the king committed was what led to the king's death. That's what Elijah the prophet said to him. You saw where the dogs licked up the blood of this man? Now, that was not a polite thing to say to the king. And he said, the same thing will happen to you because what you have done, you have sold your soul and it happened. If you read in the book of 1 Kings, if you go on to read the rest of the story about Ahab and Jezebel, I tell you, it's like an action movie. But they did fall, and they came to the end that the prophets said they would. They both died in the end, and it was not pretty. Simon the Pharisee thought that he was going to insult this Jesus, this prophet, this teacher, that he, Simon, thought was a fake and a fraud. And we know how that story turned out. So, are some lives worth more than others? Are some people just a means to an end? What does God say to us?